Okay, so I've started recording. Um, not quite going to, we, we'll wait until the, the minute ticks over, but just wanted to put out there the Kubert Summit still coming up. Um, we've got a good number of sessions already, but I was advised that, uh, you know, more wouldn't hurt. So even though it's after the deadline for the call for papers, we certainly would take more. Um, you can reach out directly to any one of us, uh, just uh, go to the uh, Kubert Dev mailing list and uh, let somebody know. And now we have three minutes after the hour, so begin the meeting. Uh, welcome. My name is Chandler Wilkerson. I'll be helping chair the Kubert community meeting for January 19th. So everybody go ahead and add in your names on the attendees list. <laughs> Capitalizes it. And first order of business is, uh, do we have anybody who would like to introduce themselves? You can unmute and kind of- Can you put the-, the name in a little bit about uh, what you're doing with Kubert. Can you put the link on the chat to the document? Sorry, my audio is very bad. Thank you. Can you repeat that? I'm, I'm sorry, I think my speakers were off. That was Andres. Who's asking for a link to oh, the Google oh, Docs? I, I posted it. We're, we're good. You. Okay, very good. Thanks. Um, I think. Um, at least uh, the link to the uh, meeting notes is also in the uh, in the invitation, right? Yes, it is, and it hasn't changed. We we might talk at some point about whether we want to have a different one for every year or you know, like start you know having them uh, archived. But hey, my name is Abhishek, and uh, sorry, uh, hi, my name is Abhishek. I joined this community recently. Uh, the CNCF community where I found this this particular link for Qbert. So uh, I'm very new to this Qbert. Uh, so probably if if someone can have help me on understanding how this Qbert will help, and I I have requested for the access of this link. Uh, can you please approve? Okay, I'll look into that. I'm not sure if I have the the right access. You, you're trying to get. Uh... Which link? The the one to the meeting notes? Uh, this docs.google.com, whatever the link you open, uh, I have requested for the access. Uh, oh, okay. So in order to get access to that, you have to join the Google group and then you will automatically have access to it. And the Google group. Right, that would be. I'm assuming it's right on the front page, but. Uh... I'm out of practice for finding it. Community page. Which would be there. Yeah, this one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, join our forum. I believe that gets you into the Google group and um, that's open to anybody. So once you, once you are on that, you'll also have the uh, calendar invite and um, access to the docs. Okay, thank you. Welcome. And besides that, you, uh, if you have any questions, you, we also have a Slack chat that is, uh, that is in the, on the same page. So um, feel free to join and ask questions, for example, uh, in any of the uh, Qbert uh, uh, Slack channels that we have there, virtualization of Qbert Dev. I guess, first of all, maybe virtualization first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, if we don't have any other uh, new introductions, then we can move on to the agenda. 
think we have something about coveralls. I, I heard that my audio volume is very low. I'm not sure why that is. Um, can, can you still hear me okay or um, is it low? I can hear you okay. Okay, so yeah. Um, okay, I wanted just, uh, I, I had a question to ask uh, regarding the coverage uh, that we are um, running on all acute word uh, PRs. So uh, first of all, um, we had a time, I think, where we were beyond 70% of coverage. And uh, this uh, value is slowly starting to drop again. So I think we are now near the bottom line of 70% and maybe losing beyond that. So I was thinking about whether, do we want to enforce something like a lower boundary of, of coverage value or do we just, um, do we just want to, that to happen naturally by uh, PR um, reviewers that maybe uh, tell people that they should add a test here or a test there. Because I think in general, coverage is just something that is a best practice. I don't, I wouldn't say that that coverage uh, of, in itself is bad, of course not. But sometimes it's a little bit awkward if you have, yeah, the, the, you, have, you have the famous uh, test, um, um, uh, test coverage uh, things that just uh, run uh, things and, and don't test anything or something like that. So what is the general opinion of that? Should we, should we uh, enforcing lower boundaries or should we just um, keep it like, like it is now? So one thing to, to add a little context to what Daniel's uh, bringing up here. Um, we had a PR this week that was exclusively removing lines. And, and in general, that's absolutely good because less code, like if the code's just cropped and not needed, absolutely take it out. And so, but unfortunately, because it was removing lines from the total, that's one of the dynamics that dropped our, um, our coverage beneath that 70% threshold. And the coverage bot rejected it based solely on the fact that it had fallen underneath the, the, the line. And this is a gating uh, 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 lane. And so that, um, that just begs the question as to, wait a minute, you know, this is something that's intrinsically good. And any, any developer would look at it and say, that's absolutely a good thing to do. But the, because of our artificial rules, that, that became problematic. And so that, that's kind of the context to where this question is coming from. Yeah, and also, also I was was just thinking about what what the community thinks in general about coverage. Also, so uh, I want to want to get a feeling of um, how we should be uh, handling all this coverage stuff. I think it's a good tool. So to have the coverage reports is is valuable because. Uh, we can go in after the report's made and see what areas are covered, what areas lack coverage. Uh, and I, I've certainly used that in the past to kind of understand um, where we need improvement. Uh, like Stu pointed out, it can get a little hairy when we're doing changes that are actually good in the coverage report and we enforce it. Uh, doesn't necessarily match reality. So we also have like lots of generated code as well. So we could have an enormous amount of generated code that uh, might not technically be tested. I'm not sure if that happens or not, but that would be another thing that would kind of put it in, um, like offset the, uh, the percentage tested versus um, what was actually like new logic. I feel uncomfortable with making a hard requirement um, that we should stay around a certain threshold or not drop below a certain threshold or something like that. And I think that um, it's kind of on the reviewer's part to uh, use this as a tool, use the coverage as a tool to understand, well, if it dropped a lot during this review for some reason, well, why did that happen? Is that something we care about? Is that something we don't care about? And use that kind of as a discretionary thing. Uh, that would be my take at least. So you're saying, if I understand correctly, that uh, we shouldn't impose any uh, enforcement on, for example, 
dropping uh, by a certain percentage or below a certain percentage, right? I'm hesitant to do that. I'd be interested in other thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant because I think there's going to be situations where it drops and uh, that's okay. And then we have to make a decision. Uh, what's our policy at that point? Like if we're saying that there's um, reviewer discretion uh, with this unit test or this coverage test and this threshold, then does it have value to begin with for us to enforce it? Um, I, I'm unsure, yeah. Uh, I can, I can, I think an example will be interesting. Like if we have a, a project, a very small project, and you have two files in this project, production files, and one of them is fully covered and the other one is not covered. And then you do a refactoring and say, oh, I don't need the, I don't need the production code of the covered file. So you delete it with its test. So now you have zero coverage. Before you had 50% coverage, now you have zero coverage because you removed half of the code. So I think so, this is what happens sometimes that lowers the bar, but it's not worse. It's just reflecting that the rest of the code that is there is less covered. So a rule like having a minimum, it's problematic in this sense, I think. I guess this is one of the scenarios that you gave here that happened. You you added code of tests, but and you did cover more, but but compared to the everything else, you just added more code. So it's comparable, it's less coverage. Yeah. I guess. And Something here's else. another scenario. Uh, it doesn't always reflect even when um, more test coverage is necessary. So let's say somebody makes a 20 line change to one of our controllers or something like that. That might need quite a bit of test coverage depending on where that is in the code and like what critical code path that is involved there. Now, if that doesn't get touched, we're talking about a fraction of a percentage difference in our test coverage report, but that doesn't reflect how critical that one area was. So it's not catching necessarily really important things either. Yeah, it makes sense. Is there a way to weight coverage? To, to give it a weight? I don't think so. Uh, I think all coverage is equal in, in that point. But uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to get back to David, what David said about uh, that we are uh, also covering uh, generated code. And I think I worked on that topic and I just removed all the generated files from the coverage report. So I think we should be at least good there. Does that account for like new APIs and things like that as well? Like how, yeah, I um, think, yeah. I think we are filtering by, uh, by file extension. So if there is some, for example, like, like most of the, I don't remember exactly, but I think there is something like generated go or something in, in the file. Uh, most of the time, and at least uh, those we filter out when we uh, create the report. I uh, maybe you know better uh, whether there are other extensions that we should take a look for. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I just know that when we generate like a new API, the, the client code and everything associated with that, uh, in like the staging folder, uh, is pretty extensive. Um, so I, maybe that's not included in the coverage. Maybe it is. Uh, I haven't looked at it, but. Yeah, if we're uh, ignoring some of that, then um, maybe it's more accurate. Yeah. Okay, so so in general, I think that that we shouldn't enforce any boundaries and just uh, leave it to the reviewer. I I was just thinking about probably that maybe we are. Um, uh, when the, when the PR got merged, then it's too late. And, and um, if someone overlooked, for example, missing tests or something, um, th there could be situations that the reviewer, because he's also just human, uh, just overlooks the fact that we didn't, we, uh, he forgot to ask, uh, that the author forgot to ask tests or something. But yeah, I think that's something that, that we then should see at least with the coverage uh, 
uh, values uh, decreasing to a certain point. And yeah, okay. I think we should leave that to the reviewer. Yeah, it is a risk. What would it look like just as an alternative to this uh, if we made this required, um, this coverage report uh, required not to drop below a certain percentage or whatever for us as a reviewer to override that. So treat that as a signal that has to have a reviewer intervention to ignore. Uh, would that be as simple as just a comment to ignore that part of the test lane or how would we handle that? You can you can just override it with, with a default override command. So um, at least uh, that should be good then. That's an interesting suggestion. So basically we would say we would still have a general guideline, uh, but in certain cases we could intentionally ignore it. Yeah, yeah so. I, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, if, if we do that, um, we would need to write down a policy of how that is handled, like why it's okay to ignore it. It's something to point to that's kind of like a contract that we've all agreed on that um, this this test is informational as a signal to um, the reviewer that uh, something needs to be looked at and it's reviewer's discretion whether something needs to be changed because I don't wanna see it enforced where people have to do kind of silly things just to increase the code coverage for their PR when it makes no sense. So we need to just be explicit about our contract there so there's no confusion about what that uh, failing test means and what um, whether it's okay or not to ignore it. I think that uh, if you put the, the check in, uh, it will be read and then you ask someone to uh, maintain to override the check, that's that's nasty, I think. It's like, it's complicating everything, in my opinion. How, how about just putting a rule that it cannot drop more than 2% per, uh, per PR or something like that? So this makes sense? I think that was I think the, um, I think that was kind of, um, something like that was what we were talking about, I thought. No, I think uh, currently it was, uh, Daniel, can you can you please uh, correct me? I think the case was that it dropped below 70 or something like that, like a hard percentage just below it and that's it, no? Yes, actually it was like that. And uh, to be clear on that, we have two boundaries that we can uh, enforce. We, at first we can, for example, enforce a a certain coverage decrease in the uh, in the PR by a percentage that we want. For example, um, if we if the coverage decreases by two percent in this PR, it should fail. And also, we have the other boundary that, in general, if the uh, coverage below below a certain point, uh, um, uh, then then it can fail. So we have those two options to to enforce those rules. But yeah, like you said, Edward, uh, it fell be below 70%. And um, what, what we did at the moment is uh, that we just uh, uh, lowered the, uh, the percentage to, to, um, uh, to give some room for discussion and to decide what we exactly we want to do. Yes. So maybe, maybe just a thought, maybe just a matter of um, um, we know this is not accurate. We know that this uh, coverage is not the most important thing. It's just a signal of the state of what's going on. So if you have like 20% coverage, you are in bad shape in general. If you have 50%, you're somewhere in between. So maybe the, the rule should be that, this, uh, the, uh, that we should not go over something like a number. I don't know with, what is the number. like. If we see that we are at 70, then maybe it should be 60, I don't know. And if we reach this, uh, this number again, it means that we need to stop and, and check what's going on because we, we are dropping uh, coverage too much and, and it must be increased. So something like that, or maybe this needs to be monitored in, uh, in the long run. So yeah, something like that. I think it is already monitored, right? So we, we were at a certain point where we had, I think around, the, the peak was around 73% coverage. And 
like I tried to describe, it, it decreased over the last months again. So, um, and now finally we have been hitting this lower boundary of 70%. So, yeah, I just wanted to, to uh, put this into discussion, but I would be fine with something like um, uh, let, let the general decrease probably not be minus 2% or something in PR, because I think that would be some sign that there is something definitely wrong, at least. Um, and uh, the general rule would be, okay, so we, we drop the lower boundary altogether and just um, uh, let the reviewers decide. Yeah, and maybe just uh, take an action to investigate why it, it dropped so much in the last in the last month or something. We maybe this requires investigation. What happened? Like, and and like Stu said, uh, I think a general removing code is not a bad thing, right? So um, that's a fair point. Um, in my opinion, I have to say that um, if a reviewer sees that the PR drops coverage um, above 2%, then, I mean, he would likely not approve this PR and see that something is wrong. Um, I'm not sure what's the value of uh, not allowing and forcing the, the PR not to merge in, in, in such circumstances. It's, it's just a... Uh... Just a warning for the reviewer. I mean, some, I, for example, when I'm reviewing, I'm not, I don't think I always look at the, this number. It, it, I, I'm looking at it's not red or something. Yeah, that, yeah but I think it's just a warning for, for this 2% or whatever number you put there. Right, but right now, if the, the coverage drops by any percentage, then the test fails and it's marked as if it fails. So I think that it's already a warning right now. No, it, it, it doesn't fail if you, I think, uh, no, it doesn't fail now like this, I think. I saw that, I saw PR that uh, reduced like 0.08% coverage and it doesn't fail. I think, I think that it is failing, but it's not, um, it's, it's not required. So you can still uh, merge the PR, but it shows as, as if it failed. Really? So, okay, I think, I think, um, I think that the general tendency is, is uh, not enforcing a low, lower general barrier and um, letting reviewers decide probably on, on uh, whether that PR is good, good to merge. So at least uh, that's what I understand. And I, I can, of course, live with that. OK, so um, if, you, if you don't mind, I would just go to the next uh, topic, if you want, Chandler. Please do. OK, thank you. So um, another thing I wanted to mention was uh, that we sometimes have problems in uh, reviewers not being active anymore because they have left the project for some reason or are inactive in, in another sense. Um, so what I saw what Kubernetes does is uh, it, it, it looks at least like that, that they every year or start of the year, they, they run some tool and, and to clean out the uh, owner's files uh, with data from the dev stats from Kubernetes. And I was thinking about that we could probably do the same. Um, so that there would be some automated or, or at least, or, or even a manual run of, of this tool and uh, just clean out the, uh, uh, the, the owner's files. Uh, so uh, what do others think on that? That's, we could. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we do have a published governance doc, which does touch on this. So if we decide to change course, that will have ramifications that need to be actually documented. Yeah, makes sense. I don't think we're gonna have much pushback uh, from removing people from the 
reviewers section of the owner's files. I think that we have some policies in place um, where some just, I think a few people have to help decide for the owners, um, sorry, the approvers. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the policy was. So what I guess what I'm trying to say is I can see an automated policy around reviewers, which are the people that automatically get assigned to PRs. And so we could do something like if um, people within the reviewers list uh, haven't done a review, I don't know, in three months, then probably they aren't doing reviews uh, anymore. Um, and I think it would probably make sense to remove them uh, in an automated way. And it's easy to re-add people uh, as well. Um, but the approvers, um, that's difficult to automate, I think, because that, that has some different um, implications. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I think that, um, and I am uh, exactly, exactly uh, trying to aim at this, that uh, inactive reviewers get at some point somehow after a certain period of inactivity just uh, removed and so that we don't have people that are inactive assigned reviews and uh, that's exactly the problem that we're trying to solve here yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know that threshold probably should be just a couple of months or so if, and then we could add them back they won't but there's a there's um it's bad if we are auto assigning people who are inactive to review things because that just means PRs start to pile up. Uh, so being aggressive there isn't necessarily a bad thing. For example, I went on paternity leave um, a few years ago and I probably should have been removed from that list, uh, but I wasn't. Um, and I probably caused a backup of PRs because of that. And I'm, I'm just thinking about that right now. Um, so. It is a problem. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll take that and, and uh, have a look into that and uh, probably create, create a PR on that. Thanks. Now, would this be mainly focused on Kubert Kubert, or would you be looking to kind of spread the um, monitoring of reviewers' activity across other repos? I think I think what what I was trying to solve here was uh, that we have a, a lot of repos under the qubit org, and I think this will make sense to to do this for all repos. So, at, at least I think so because uh, I've seen, for example, not only in qubit qubit but also in qubit qubit ci, for example, then the people getting assigned who are no longer active on the project and. Um, yeah, um, so so I, I think this will make sense for the whole Cupid org. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, certainly the repos you just pointed out make a lot of sense. I probably need to be review, uh, removed from Cubert CI and like project infra, because uh, I don't do a whole lot of reviews there, but I'm, I think I still get assigned sometimes. Um, so those definitely make sense. Uh, there are some repos in the Cubert org that maybe just aren't very active. Um, I mean, there's a lot of projects in there now. So it's possible or foreseeable that um, there's just not a lot of reviews going on at all in some repos. So if we had a policy where people got removed after not reviewing it after so much time or whatever, it might just automatically remove everyone because there was no PRs for a few months. Uh, I don't know how. So maybe it's a repo by repo sort of opt-in. Um, Maybe that makes more sense. I'm not sure. We have to look at the exact policy. That it definitely makes sense for our majorly active repos like Kubert, Kubert, uh, Kubert CI, maybe even like the storage uh, repos, uh, so the containerized data importer and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense this time. Maybe, maybe, maybe it makes sense just to send an email to the main, to the maintainer warning about this and, and then asking them to take action because to nominate an approval you need uh, you need approval uh, need maintainers so to re to remove one i think you also need the same it doesn't make sense that someone would automatically remove someone 
No, I, I think I think we're we're not talking about approvers. We're just talking about reviewers at this moment, right? Approvers shouldn't get touched, I think, because um, uh, it, we're just uh, talking about that that the people that are inactive are assigned actively reviews because they are in the reviewers list and. Um, like like David said, this, this let's uh, let's pile up uh, PRs and um, yeah, I think this doesn't make that much sense. So um, someone else should the, the people that created PR should get a fair chance of um, of uh, getting reviewed their PR within time. So um, I think that's the main problem here. Okay, I, I thought okay, but but just this is my note about this. If, if you are talking about the viewer. And I must say, on all my PRs that I sent, none of, of the ones that were assigned as reviewer were reviewing my PRs. So, so this is this mechanism doesn't really work. I mean, I need to pick them my, myself, and that's it. It it will probably work if we have uh, owner files under specific folder, because then it will be more focused. But currently, we get uh, a random. Uh, Random, almost random review on anything. So at least this is my experience. I don't know if others have a different experiences here. No, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I have the same problem most of the time. But this is, I think, this is a different problem um, from from that what what I'm I was thinking about at least. But yeah, this is a different problem that also needs to get solved somehow. Maybe this is also something that we should talk about. Um, hi, this is something really that I want to bring up. Uh, I put it in the chat already. Um, it's the fact that uh, reviewers actually are actually tied to branches. So, uh, if you're in the owner file of a branch, you can still be assigned as a reviewer for that branch, uh, i.e. backports, uh, even if you're removed from main. And I think it's wrong. I think the owner's file from main should be uh, used for every branch. Oh, that's really interesting. So the approvers, is that apply to approvers? So a approver who maybe got removed would still have uh, approval to all the previous branches. Yeah, approvers, reviewers, the, everything uh, that's in owner uh, aliases. That's interesting. Never thought about that. So you would have to cherry pick removals of maintainers right. and approvers? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's interesting. I, I don't know what to think. Of, like, I don't know if any action needs to take place because of that. But that's a, uh, it's a good thing to understand at least. Sounds like the conversation is kind of slowed down on that. Uh, do we want to move on to the next item? Yeah, I think so. I think I think that that I have everything regarding opinions on, on that. And uh, just just my my conclusion from that is that I'm going to create a PR for a couple of repos and uh, ping the maintainers of the repos and um, just um, ask uh, them whether we would be good to go with that. What I bring up. No. Okay. So the, the next item is one that I put in. Uh, I kind of mentioned this at the top, but before I started recording, so I want to talk again. We want to make sure that everybody knows about the Kubert Summit coming up. It's in February, mid mid February. It's a two day virtual event. And though the call for session proposals has closed as of this uh, previous weekend, 
we wouldn't mind seeing another, you know, session proposal or two. Uh, we we have enough, we think, but uh, it's it's kind of on the the envelope of being enough. So if anybody else, especially somebody from uh, like a, a newer um, maybe a newer organization that is joining the, the Kubert effort uh, wants to put in the session proposal, you can reach out to us directly, uh, either through the uh, dev mailing list or uh, you can send it directly to me. That's cwilkers at redhat.com. And I've got that email address in the notes as well. So next, uh, Edward. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just, every week I'm finding something else. Another uh, small point about uh, backward compatibility when we talk about the uh, upgrading cover. So I wonder if we can, if, if you think it makes sense to have some kind of user guide policy for a developer to, in what scenarios to think about. Probably some kind of metrics they need to consider when when they add something yeah uh in general we have a guide when it comes to our api i believe so backwards incompatible changes would be removing a field from the api or modifying the name uh, of a value within the api uh, we don't have a great policy when it comes to things beyond that today and I don't even have a numerated list of everything involved there. It's kind of complicated. So it's the, the handler and launcher communication channel. Um, we, we probably have some things around RBAC with the operator. So you can't remove RBAC from the operator or else it, it prevents the ability to upgrade and things like that. I think it makes sense um, to maybe at least begin documenting what we know causes backwards uh, or even forwards compatibility issues. Yeah, like uh, the, the minimum is here, I, in my opinion, the minimum is what, what are the options that can be deployed? So in the deployment of, uh, of the upgrade uh, that we can, for example, I think uh, we had already this uh, previously discussed that uh, handlers can be of a different version at some at a specific point of time, and uh, the controller and the handler can be a different version, so it causes the launchers to be of different versions for different handlers. So that's that this kind of thing. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's good to to document the different possibilities so people understand how these interactions occur and the things to be aware of. Yeah, it's tricky. It's definitely tricky. I would also maybe add a deprecation policy. Yeah, that might be a th or, um, orthogonal to the backwards compatibility. Well, it is related, you're right, because um, it defines when we are uh, allowing backwards incompatibility changes to occur. So it's the process leading up to uh, a controlled, <laughs> a controlled breakage of that sort of thing. Yeah, good thought. So Edward, is that something that you were planning to work on? Sorry, I had a, I had, so we are, we have a current feature at the moment that uh, is, uh, is affected by this. So what we, what we are going to do, I think is have a, a matrix, a table with the different options. And I'm going to write there what uh, for this specific feature, 
if it's okay or not. So maybe we can template it in some way uh, and then we can put it for review. Is, does this make sense? And then if there is additions to it, we can add it. Yeah, makes sense. What's the, um, what's the PR or feature that you're kind of uh, using as the catalyst for uh, needing uh, this policy, just out of curiosity? Well, it's, it's uh, I think it's the, the one that, it's about the SRV um, hot plug. Uh, it's, we changed the, there is this proposal now to change the, the way we hot plug the, the SRV devices. So instead of doing it as part of the migration flow that we unplug and plug back in the migration flow, we'll, we'll hot plug it as part of the reconcile. That was the, I mean, it will every time in the reconcile of the, of the virt handler, it will look at the desire, the, the desired state of having n number of uh, SRV devices. And based on the current state, it will try to reach the desired state by hot plugging the whatever is needed or not doing anything. Got it. That, yeah. That's a, that's a really good example. Um, so I imagine that it's possible. I, I don't remember all the context of this PR, but I remember it uh, now that we have to carry some old logic with us for a certain amount of time. Um, is that the case here? And then we want to be able to, to remove that uh, in the future. I think it's, it's that they, currently there is a, a mechanism that does the hot plug as part of the migration flow and uh, and and we are we are changing into this reconcile loop and there is the there is there are changes in the communication between the vet handler and bit launcher but we at least there is uh, consequences if the for example if there is a new vet handler old vet launcher or new build launcher and old build handler, it, it matters here because you added the new GRPC command. Got it. So eventually what we would like is to depreciate uh, or deprecate, um, <laughs> deprecate the old behavior uh, where it was handled probably like Burt launcher or something, the hot plug. Um, but uh, there's a certain amount of time that we have to wait for everyone to, um, update and for these APIs within Vert Launcher to be available for the hot plug and, and things like that. So yeah, this, this policy um, would define, I guess, that timeline for when we can remove that logic um, that's looking to see if this new hot plug API exists or not and invoking it if it exists and ignoring it, I guess, if it doesn't. Uh, eventually, we just want to always assume that it exists. Yeah, well, I'm still optimistic that uh, my metrics in the end will show everything is green. But, uh, but yes, yeah, it may reach this point that we are uh, we need to wait or support both or something like that. So I just made a guess at which PR you're talking about. Is this the right one? I can put it in the notes. Uh, no, it's this is the it's merged. It's unmerged. Okay. It's not mine also, I think. It's, okay. uh, I will, I will uh, try to edit later. I'm not, okay. uh, I don't have access to it. But anyway, I think uh, what I'll do, I uh, will prepare this document with the metrics and then we'll share it as a, maybe as a, an example for, the for what we are talking about. Okay, I think we can move on to the open floor. Edmar? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, so this is an issue I've made uh, in order to raise a discussion. 
so basically, there was an attempt to uh, to run Qpert on a very large cluster. And the problem is that we always have two replicas of Qpert API pod. Um, the problem is that if we're trying to uh, create a very large number of VMs at once, then uh, the, these two replicas have to run all the validating webhooks for all the VMs. Um, and this is a major scalability issue. Um, also, we saw that the CPU utilization for these two replica was very, very high uh, all through the, this period. So I thought to basically leverage uh, Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler in order to uh, autoscale these components. We can start with the Verde API and we can base it on CPU usage, which would be um, the easiest. And I just wanted to raise attention on that and maybe raise a discussion. So this is the horizontal pod autoscaler. So um, this means we would be creating more replicas of Bird API to handle the increased load from uh, the validation and mutation webhooks. I think my first thought on this is to understand um, where the scalability problems are actually occurring within our controller. So I think before I would look at horizontally scaling, I would look at if there are any really easy efficiency wins um, that we can have within our uh, our component there. So maybe we're doing something super inefficient. I, I don't know. I'd like to understand that before um, maybe moving on to something more complex that uh, might even potentially be hiding the issue. So if we can create more instances and we uh, are just kind of scaling an inefficient component, then that's not necessarily great. But if it's in fact that, you know, we're as efficient as we can realistically or practically be, then yeah, uh, looking to horizontally scaling would, uh, would not hurt. Well, well, one thing that comes to mind um, along what you're just saying, David, the lines of that, um, when you look at an average controller and there's a lot of contention going on, we, do log a lot of retries uh, due to the pattern we use of, you know, grab objects, fiddle with it and issue an update as opposed to patching. And I know that we've got, you know, independent efforts to do that, but I wonder how much, uh, how much more responsive could we be if we were indeed being more surgical about how we actually updated objects and didn't end up retrying five times or making that number up, of course, but. Hmm. I wonder, so, Specifically, we're talking about the vert API component here. Um, when we're doing the retries in our vert controller loop, I'm unsure if uh, if there's a collision um, in that update, if it actually makes it to our API or not, or if it's caught before our API uh, server would see it. So I'm not sure if those requests are forwarded on to our mutation and validation webhooks. Uh, they might Fair be, point. but uh, that would be something to to investigate a little bit. Under normal operation, where we are just doing updates and creates and deletes of objects, I'm really surprised that we would need to go beyond two replicas for vert API. Once we start introducing uh, console and BNC access or anything that has like a persistent connection that's being forwarded from vert API to controller to launcher pod, that's when things get kind of hairy um, with performance I've seen. So definitely in that scenario, we would uh, want to have the ability to scale API for APIs. Under normal operation where that isn't like a huge burden, if we have problems with two replicas, I'm really curious where the problems are. Like um, if we could do some profiling, for example, that would be really interesting. We have a, a pprof profiler now. Um, it's one of the features that was added sometime in the middle of last year that allows us to do a CPU profile of a live system uh, over a certain time period and then create like heat graphs and things like that out of it. 
Um, I would be interested to see when we do one of these load tests or something like this, where we're spending the most time uh, in BERT API when this is occurring to give us an idea if this is something that we could improve or not improve. And maybe that's um, in addition to this discussion about horizontally scaling, because it makes sense for people to need to horizontally scale. I'm not sure if the automated way makes more sense or just exposing the knobs for people to adjust a replica account for their vert API component because they they know up front that they need more due to their um, their environment. Yeah, I was just about to touch on that. Um, one of the concerns I have with doing a horizontal pod autoscaler based on CPU usage is it might be too late. If you hit the API server with 400 concurrent start VM requests, uh, the damage is done by the time you're actually rolling out new replicas, I think. And so it might be something where if we had a way to be smarter ahead of time about anticipating that we could need that many uh, API replicas to have them ready. I'm looking at Did the kill the discussion here. Like no, you thing. didn't kill the discussion. Uh, I, I, you're you're right. You're right. And I'm looking at this um, this bugzilla that's attached to it. Uh, it's unfortunate these these comments are private. So if somebody isn't working at Red Hat here, they won't have any context. But uh, I can say. Yeah, it's it's unclear exactly where it's breaking down here. So our webhook um, context. Yeah, it is our webhook that's timing out. Huh. Yeah, I think that the problem was validating webhooks. And by the way, I, I totally agree that we need to further investigate it, that we don't want to hide any inefficiencies. But I do think that this have um, some kind of a limit, right? So if, if we're using like a thousand nodes cluster, I guess the two replicas won't do it even if we're very efficient. But I also agree that we can expose uh, the knobs to HCO or something like that instead of um, doing this automatically. Although in, in the, the horizontal uh, pod autoscaler, we can um, have a maximum and minimum um, replica um, count. So yeah, but either way, either one of them is good. Yeah, I'd definitely like to understand this issue a little bit better, the, the Bugzilla, um, because there's, there's potentially things that aren't even related to CPU and memory here. So uh, when our webhook is hit, with a, an update, um, a VM or a VMI, that can cause a chain reaction with our API, like Kubernetes API access. We can say um, an update is occurring on a VMI. As a result of that, we need to go off and gather some information about the larger system as a whole, maybe uh, do a git on some PVCs or other information. And it can have like an amplification effect on the webhooks client access to the API server, like the Kubernetes API server, in a way that we could get throttled. So it could be that we are actually timing out, uh, not because of CPU and memory usage, but because the Kubernetes API server itself is throttling us um, because we're making too many requests or things like that. Um, so something to understand uh, a little bit more uh, fully before we um, look at an automated solution. It's also interesting, uh, so I've seen a lot of performance tests done, and uh, this performance test is different in that it uses persistent storage, where previous performance tests have used ephemeral storage, so not using PVCs. I wonder, I haven't, 
feeling it might have to do with the fact that we're using PVCs and that maybe our webhook is doing something inefficient once PVCs are involved, like introspecting PVCs. Maybe it's not using an informer when it should, or maybe it's difficult to use an informer there. We're having to do a lot of Git requests. I'm unsure. So I made an attempt to capture that in a pithy note. So, so I, I heard uh, performance profiling and uh, check on inefficiencies in the components uh, before jumping to auto scaling as a recommendation. Sounds great. That's where I would start. And that's not to say that auto scaling shouldn't be investigated in the future. We just need to justify it. Thanks for the great points of discussion. And with that, we're within two minutes of the top of the hour. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to raise? Yes, let me explain. Uh, here's Andre from DDesk. Mm -hmm. uh, how we approach the same issue you having. We have a central API that controls uh, all the load and then starts to control in every one of the 100 clusters we have uh, the load, not only in, a, in this specific cluster, but uh, across all cl clusters, because these clusters are also across data centers. Um, for you understand what we are trying to achieve. Uh, it's high availability and also auto scaling. It's something that we are approaching. Uh, we are not counting for 100% of auto scaling of Kubernetes itself. We are also controlling the load uh, that are coming to the cluster. And if something goes wrong with a, a, a specific cluster, we can spread all over uh, several clusters, the load coming. Or you know how we are addressing, like everybody logging in at 7 a.m. <laughs> uh, coming to the service, <laughs> okay? So do you have kind of predictive uh, modeling of that load? We have an API that controls uh, the load and can, uh, let's say, load balancing across clusters. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay? Because a single cluster doesn't fit all our needs. We have 100 clusters with uh, up to 1,250 nodes in each cluster. Is there anyone uh, working on the part of virtualization of GPUs? This is, uh, we are very interested in this topic because we are having some issues on the NVIDIA licensing terms and things. Uh, I can send you uh, send a link of uh, exactly what we are talking about uh, here, just one second. Well, it might be better to bring that to the mailing list because I think people are already starting to drop the, the meetings kind of at time. Okay, no problem at all. But I, I can definitely capture that in the notes if you'd like. Yeah, just put the link here. Uh, okay. okay, it's on the chat. Is there anyone working on the part of virtualization of GPUs? And this was the Red Hat work.
Okay. It's called para virtualization, not virtualization. Uh oh. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Enjoy your week.